Now, um, Ullmann was to the French defense what Bobby Fischer was to pawn to e4. Yeah, he did not uh, do so well in the candidates. I think he favored, he favored um, tournament play above match play, it seems. Very good res results in tournament play, but not so in, in match play. Um, I started to say Ullmann is to the French defense what Bobby Fischer is to E4. And so in this game, you can see Robert James Fisher is white and Wolfgang Ullmann is black, which means we know it's going to be a French defense because Bobby never played hardly anything but E4, except for maybe 20 games where he played C4. And Ullmann, out of, um, I think it was 372 times that somebody played E4 against Ullmann, 372 times he faced this move, and 363 of those 372, in other words, all but nine, he played E6. Seven of those times, I think, he played G6. So all but nine, almost exclusively, just as Bobby was almost exclusively E4. Well, let's flip it around so we see it from Ullmann's perspective. And there are several books written by Ullmann on the French defense, by the way. And so, look those up. So, e4, e6, d4. And we mentioned uh, this morning when we made our first attempt at today's Grandmaster that a lot of players like e6 whether the, their opponent plays e4 to start with or d4. Because a lot of times, if they play d4 and you play e6, then they'll play e4, and now you're in a French defense. Mike Leahy likes that. So, Mike Leahy finds it to be um, versatile for that reason, because many games that start out e4 or d4 end up in a French defense for him, and he's very familiar with it. So d4, d5, knight f3, and this is uh, the vinever tabia here with bishop b4, advanced variation here, and knight to e7, and pawn to a3, bishop takes check, and b takes. A very normal setup. I mentioned this morning one of the drawbacks of the French defense is the bishop, the light squared bishop, the queen's bishop, takes a long time to get into the game. He's caged in many of the times. So c5, a4, knight bc6, knight f3, and bishop to d7, and queen to d2, and queen to a5. Now this move begs the move pawn to c4. I've played this move many times myself. And the whole idea is now you're just reinforcing black's cage, caging himself in. And it's going to, again, be a long time before this bishop has any influence in the game. In the meantime, he experiences so-called tall pawn syndrome. Um, I, there are versions of the Karo Khan, I, I guess, that can close up the center like this. Let me think here. Karo Khan, e4, c6, d4, d5. And then if you play e5, the difference is this c pawn is not going to be on c4. It'll be on c6. So 
So now pawn to f6. And bishop to a3. Knight to g6. Castles. I guess my... I guess you can see that all right. I didn't... I didn't change this setup on, on this screen, so I'll have to do that later. Figure out how to change that. I can at least slide this over and up a bit. That way it's a little more contrast. So castling to the queen side, I said this morning, it's it's remarkable. You know, a lot of times they'll leave their king uncastled or move it up in here. But presumably white will attack over here on the b-file. Castling into that and immediately White occupying d6 with his bishop. Very interesting position. So knight c to e7. And here knight to a4, h4 looks a little unusual. But the knight on g6 is defending the knight on e7, so knight takes h4 is not possible. So after rook to e8 from the d8 square, now why not the h rook? Well, he's going to want to use this h rook to make Simon Williams, the ginger GM, very happy. And sure enough, after knight takes g6, pawn takes g6, begins to punctuate the power of the rook on h8. So pawn takes f6, and then g takes f6. And now h3 to try to mitigate the influence of the rook on it, the h-file. Now this bishop is going to have to find another place to go. And Ulman says, please do that now. Well, bishop to h2. He likes the idea of having some influence here toward the king's side. And although his scope is otherwise limited, um, he wants to stay on that diagonal. Now my question is, can the diagonal be obstructed with an e-pawn push? Pawn to e4, uh, e5, defended by the f-pawn. Well, here he decided to push the G-man. Looking for a pawn break, no doubt. A pawn to F4. Saying, I want to get my rook operating on a file. Now, knight to D6. And... He did not play, I, I thought the capture would be perfectly normal and natural here. Because that opens the file for your rook, isn't that the point? That was not played because he instead he played bishop to f3. Because as you can see, if the pawn takes... Well, the knight might like to come up here and harass the queen. And now the queen's got to move. Also creates a super attack on c3. 
but he's also got to deal with this pawn, so he probably would not deploy that super attack. He'd probably take the G pawn once the queen moved. Well, in any case, that move wasn't played. Instead, bishop to f3 stops the knight from ever going to e4. And g4 is a very forcing move, forcing the h-file open. Okay, you can take it, but if you do, Again, you're letting go of the e4. You could be asking for trouble. So you're asking for trouble either way. An open h file would make me very nervous with my king over there. So f5 now. and g5. Now, so you can see this poor bishop on h2. Its influence has been totally erased. He might be rethinking having placed his bishop there. Now he's the one that's caged in by his own pawns. And it's questionable how he'll ever get out. The king certainly does not, does not, uh, cannot move to h1 and move into a pin. But if the king moves, the bishop is hanging. The bishop might like to come to g1, but how does he ever get there? Well, he's going to have to move the g-man, move his king, move his bishop. It could take three moves before he can ever get that bishop doing anything. And before that ever happens, well, we already see where this rook is coming. This is not going to be a pretty picture. Looks like he's going to have to move the pawn and then bring up a rook to defend on the second rank. Oh, no, instead he came this way. Okay, that, duh, why didn't I see that to begin with? Why did I think he couldn't move there? In my mind, I still had my knight on the, <laughs> on the E4 square, thinking he couldn't move there, I guess. I don't know where my brain was. But that was silly of me to think that. All right, so queen E3, knight to E4, bishop takes knight, and pawn takes bishop. And now the king gets himself out of that little exposure. Rook from e7 to h7. Now Bobby moves the b file as predicted. Is this going to afford safety for, for white? It's a shame to have that queen standing there in front of the advanced e pawn. Queen to d5. Queen to c1. And rook to h1. Wow. That's astonishing. What? Bobby giving up his queen for two rooks. I did not expect that. I expected him to simply move his queen. Can he not just move his queen back somewhere? The 
course these two pawns what if he moves the queen this way queen b2 maybe well I was thinking a3 if he's worried about black making an outside passer so you move the queen rook takes rook take but of course if you play to b2 you can just take with the queen and don't have to worry about relinquishing the pawn so if you play whoa what did i miss there oh he can't play he has to stay he has to keep an eye on this square because if you allow check Oh man, this could get ugly. This gets ugly. King F2. Yeah, this is gonna, that's losing. You can't play queen. You have to keep the queen over here. Which I'm sure this move is still coming if he gives up his queen for two rooks. Well, let's see what happened. Takes. Oh, he went ahead and played it right away immediately. Didn't even take the queen. King g1. Now he takes the queen. Now he pushes the pawn. Wow. Wow. And you have queen against rook and bishop. Queen against rook and bishop. Rook e1. I think we just start pushing the pawn up the board. Not enough time. And Bobby resigned here. So I don't think he really should have allowed the pawn push. You've got to keep the queen either on d2 or e3. So let's say, let's just stop the pawn push altogether. And if he takes, and you take, and the bishop takes this pawn. Okay, that does create a passer, but can the rook go right back to a1? Well, no, because then pawn to b5. But this looks a little bit better than for black than... Um, I mean, for white than the other. Even though he doesn't have any real mobility. It's really awkward for black, uh, for white, I should say. He's He's got, his pieces are stifled. But how does white, uh, how does Ulman continue? How does black continue from here? So anyway, Ulman wins.